author, Anna Barbary, wrote once that when her son was, her, her son Ben was five years old, his goldfish died. And so Glenda wanted to have walked the child through this season of pet grief, said, well, you got to send the goldfish back to God, expecting that she would bury the fish in their flower pot. A couple days later, though, um, she was surprised to get a phone call from their small country post office, and the lady that uh, had called her said, uh, could you please come over? I have to show you something. And so she goes and sees the postmaster, and she gets here, and the postmaster says, Linda, a lot is expected of the post office, but this is the most amazing delivery we've ever been asked to make. And so she handed Glenda an envelope with big blue letters on the outside, to God from Ben, and inside a very flat, very dead goldfish. <laughs> Kids are wonderful, aren't they? And Jesus, many times in his ministry, uh, wrote about children, or at least used uh, children as an illustration. We looked at a couple weeks ago uh, when Jesus spoke about humility, that he used a child uh, as an illustration. And today's message is a, kind of probably the same story, a continuation of that same conversation. We are in Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 50. It says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around the neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. So there's a lot going on. In that passage. So this morning, I hope that we can walk through this passage a little bit. There's really two main points, though, to this passage. The first point that Jesus wants to make in this is be careful how you influence others. Be careful how you influence others. Jesus says here in verse 21 or verse 42, excuse me, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble. It would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. He says one of these little ones, and of course, at this point, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, he has a child uh, among them. He's using this child as an illustration. But when he says little ones, he's not just referring to what we would consider children. That the child is an illustration. Remember, he's also, we looked at last week, he's also responding the disciples that had told this man who was driving out demons in Jesus' name, and the disciples said, told the man to stop driving out demons in Jesus' name because he didn't have authority from Jesus to do so. Jesus is also referring to that man that they told to stop. Stop, in, stop preventing him from doing ministry in my name. Stop trying to impede the ministry of somebody who's following Jesus. Jesus says, don't cause one of these little ones to sin. The, the Greek word is the word skandalizo. It's where we get the word scandal from. But in the Greek, the picture that's really painted by that word is a baited trap that slams shut. Don't trap people into sinfulness. Don't, don't uh, trick them into sin. Lead them into it. You know, we hate to hear of, of, of murders. We hate to hear of assaults that happen uh, when they happen to grown-ups. But when it happens to a child, we are especially offended, aren't we? I was glad to hear this last week because I believe they finally caught the Delphi murderer. 
those two girls in Delphi, Indiana, that were killed, what, almost six years ago? Now they finally think they've caught the guy. I remember soon after those murders take, took place, our family was driving, just happened to be driving through Delphi and stopped at a gas station, and the pictures were everywhere. Have you seen this person, or, or do you have information about these killings? When a child is victimized, we get especially upset. If somebody kills a grown-up, we call them a murderer. If somebody kills a child, we call them a monster. We know inherently that to protect, that to protect young life, we, we should protect the most vulnerable among us. We know this. And yet in this passage, Jesus calls, not, he's not just speaking of children, he calls us little ones. We, God's children, are the little ones that he's speaking of here. You are God's child. He's just as protective of you as we are protective of little children that we have living among us. That's how he looks at you. And so when somebody puts a stumbling block in front of one of his children, he is very upset by that. As uh, somebody has once remarked, your picture is on God's refrigerator. That's how he looks at you. Jesus, in a similar passage in Matthew 18, 7, said it this way. He said, uh, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Temptation is going to come. False teaching is going to come. Jesus knows that, but you don't want to be the one that's responsible for it. And so Jesus uses this illustration here in Mark 9 of a large millstone hung around that person's neck and the thrown into the sea. If we can go to the next slide, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie, for running PowerPoint uh, this morning. This is actually a picture of a donkey pulling a millstone like Jesus is referring to. Okay? The millstone is that large circular rock uh, what they would do is they would put their grain inside of that little trough, uh, the donkey that's tied to the, the, the wood that pulls, it walks in a circle, and the millstone then goes around, and that 500 to 1,000 pound millstone grinds up the wheat into flour so they can use it to make bread. It was a big stone, and Jesus says it would be better if you are putting a stumbling block in front of one of my children for one of those stones to be hung around your neck and you're tossed into the ocean. Now that is a very, that's a pretty big, kind of dark illustration, isn't it? Like where did he come up with that? It's a graphic illustration of God's judgment against the wicked. Now I was reading as I was preparing for the sermon that it's possible the reason that Jesus uses this illustration was because there was a popular misconception in those days that if you were lost at sea, if you drowned and they didn't recover your body, you sank to the bottom of the ocean, that you could not be resurrected at the last day. Now, that's not true, of course. It's a misconception. God, The resurrection, God has no difficulty. People will ask me, well, what do you think about like cremation? Is that something that we're allowed to do as Christians? Look, there's not an issue with God being able to put you back together after you're dead. The resurrection is not too difficult, even if you are at the bottom of the ocean. But people thought that. They thought, if, if I'm lost at sea, I'm not going to be resurrected. And Jesus might be speaking to this a little bit. Jesus might be saying, look, if you are going to put a stumbling block in front of one of my followers, you're going to lead them, you're going to entrap them into sin, it would be better for you to not be resurrected than it would be for you to be resurrected from the dead and face the punishment that you're going to get. You'd be better off staying at the bottom of the ocean than going where you're going to go if you put a stumbling block in front of a child. That is a, that is a lot, isn't it? A picture of God's judgment. And it should give pause to all of us that influence others, right? We should be careful how we influence others. Others, especially leaders in the church. That's one of the reasons that Paul said, look, not everybody should say, I'm going to be a leader in the church uh, because there's more expected of those who say, yeah, I'm going to be the teacher. I'm going to be the one that, that shares the word with others. We have to be careful. 
Now, Jesus here is not talking about, like, if you just fall short. I'm sure there's been times when unintentionally I have interpreted the Word of God incorrectly. In my 18 years of ministry, at some point, I'm sure I've gotten the context wrong, or I've accidentally taught something that maybe wasn't exactly the best way to teach it. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about people that will intentionally try to lead others away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or to put a stumbling block in front of those who are legitimately trying to follow Jesus, and then they cut in and try to lead them away from the church, lead them away from the truth. And there's a part of me that wishes that this verse, Mark 9, 42, had a bigger role in our society. So we have to be careful how we influence others, especially at a time when there's so many that teach that there's 47 genders, when Scripture says God created them, male and female, when we normalize behavior that Scripture forbids, and when people will so distrust in, script, in the Scriptures, you can't believe the Bible. That's just a bunch of stories. You really want to believe that? Or, or when others these days will so distrust in parents. Your parents don't understand you. Your parents don't know what they're talking about. I have the real truth. Don't listen to them. They just don't get it. We should be careful. Because as Jesus warns us here, putting a stumbling block in front of others who are trying to follow him has repercussions. And our society, in a lot of ways, has gotten rid of God, but that means they've also gotten rid of the idea that we're going to be held accountable for the way that we lead others, for the way we influence others. And that's tragic and it's dangerous. We must be careful how we influence others. But we also, as Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, we should, because of our love for one another, seek to protect our brothers and sisters from sin as well. How do we do that? Well, Jesus kind of refers to this in verse 50 when he says, um, have salt among yourselves. Now, these last couple of verses we looked at in this passage, does it seem like it's almost like it changes the subject a little bit? That may be because there are some scholars that believe that maybe verses like 49 and 50 weren't originally a part of that conversation that Jesus was having here, but Mark says, okay, there's, Jesus taught this at other places. I'm going to put this in this passage because it all kind of ties together with the whole salt idea. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that may explain why it seems like Jesus changes subjects, uh, why he does that. But he says, have salt among yourselves. Now, we, what are we, church? Oh, and when we went over that, we talked about part of the purpose of salt. It's not just to make your food more flavorful. It preserves. It prevents decay. It prevents death. It's important for the cells, right? It, it cleans. It, it helps. It's important. And here Jesus says to his church, to his followers, have salt among yourselves. In other words, part of the purpose of the church is to prevent decay, spiritual decay within our members. Part of the purpose of the church is that we protect one another from the very things that cause us temptation, from the things that cause us sin. The church should be a safe place to avoid temptation and sin. Amen? And that's part of what Jesus, I believe, is saying here. That we don't put stumbling blocks in front of other people. We are wrapped in love as we walk in the church. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8, 13. He's speaking of there's a controversy in the Corinthian church. Some people are leaving worship and they're going down to uh, they're going down to Culver's to eat. Only that there, their Culver's, all the meat was sacrificed to idols before they served it on the plate. And so uh, they're struggling with, like, are we allowed to eat meat if it's possibly been sacrificed to an idol? And Paul's kind of saying, look, it's kind of, we know that that idol isn't a real person. It's not a real God. It's foolishness. So if you go to the market and you buy a steak, don't worry about whether maybe it's been offered to some idol. That's not that important. But there's other Christians that say, I can't do that. I feel like I'm worshiping another idol. And so he's trying to teach them to live at peace with one another. And he says in verse 13, though, therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so I will not cause them to fail. What he's saying there is, look, 
I don't mind going and buying the steak at the produce or at the, at the meat counter. I'm not worried about whether it was offered to Apollo or some other god because they're not real. But if I buy that steak and another Christian sees that and then they fall into temptation because they go, oh, I guess as Christians we're allowed to worship Apollo. If, that, if my choice to eat meat is going to cause that, then I'll just swear off meat together. I had a hard time reading that because I can't imagine swearing off meat. That's just me. <laughs> a couple months ago, uh, we had these like uh, they're like these meatless chicken nuggets. We bought them on sale, and we thought, okay, we'll try them. I'm glad I don't have to do that on a regular basis, right? It's just I mean I don't mind not eating meat, but I don't like the fake meat. That's just me. Like, just don't try to tell me it's meat when it's not, right? But Paul says, look, I'd be willing to do that. I'd be willing to eat cardboard-tasting chicken nuggets if it prevented my brother or my sister from falling into sin. Because what's most important to me is the purity of the church. It's most important to me that we all get to heaven together uh, unstained by sin. That's what's important. We have to be careful about how we influence others. We should be willing to pay any price to protect a brother or sister from falling into sin. So that's the first thing. Be careful how you influence others. And the second thing that Paul talks about, or that, excuse me, Jesus talks about in this passage, is be careful about what influences you. And this is the passage where Jesus starts talking about if, you're, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now before we get to lopping off limbs, let's talk about what's really going on here. What's really important. Because at the end of the day, everyone who's lived on this earth, when judgment day comes, they're going to go one of two places, right? That's what the word tells us. For us, those of us who put our faith in Jesus, what are we going to do? Well, Paul, or Jesus says it here. He says, we are going to enter life, verse 43. Uh, it is better for you to enter life. By life, he means eternal life. That is the goal. We are entering eternal life. Um, and then he, he talks about, in verse 47, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God. The goal, the, the end for us, involves eternal life in the kingdom of God. That's where we are going. Jesus is saying, be focused on the destination. Paul writes it this way in, in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I'm pretty sure the original text has a woohoo! Uh, I'm not sure if it got lost in the translation, but that's the idea behind it. Set your minds on heaven. Set your priorities on heaven. That's the goal. So what wouldn't we trade for eternal life? If we can go to the next picture, I'm going to embarrass my daughter here. This is a picture of Eva when she was like two years old. And there's a story behind this picture. First of all, you know, she's a sweet, beautiful girl now. She was a spunk when she was like two years old. I was, Jamie and I weren't quite sure we were going to survive those years. Because, man, she had a lot of energy and she had strong opinions about things, right? And so we went and got these pictures taken. And we could not get Eva to hold still for the photographer to take her picture. She was just all over everything. She wasn't looking at the camera. She was uh, distracted. And, and finally, I don't know how, fun, the, the, we found this fake glass of milk. And for whatever reason, when she was holding that fake glass of milk, she did whatever the photographer asked her to do. And so that's how we got this picture. She's got this you know, fake glass of milk, and there she is with that cute little smile. <laughs> But she was distractible. Are we distractible? Yeah. Which is why Paul has to say to us, set your mind, set your hearts on things above. You'd think that would be natural for us, right? Because we're going to heaven. 
You think that would fill our thoughts all the time when we think about nothing else, about how awesome it's going to be when Christ returns and we're with him in the kingdom, but we get distracted. Like a two-year-old with a fake glass of milk because you won't hold still for the camera. <laughs> what's, he, what's important? Eternal life in the kingdom is important. Now, what awaits the wicked? Jesus uses the word Gehenna. It, it, it's what we interpret as hell. But the word Gehenna is actually uh, from the, the Hebrew Ga, Valley, Hena, or Hena, which is Hinnan, the Valley of Hinnan, which was a valley outside Jerusalem that had a very important historical um, role in Israel's history because that was where the kings Ahaz and Manasseh sacrificed their children, along with where other people sacrificed their children to false gods outside the city of Jerusalem. Horrible, wicked things happened there. And so when King Josiah, who was a man of God, who sought to bring revival to Judah, when he came into office, he took that valley and he turned it into a dung heap. He turned it into a trash, uh, into a, a trash yard. To, to, in order to illustrate this is not who we are, this is instead we're a place where the fire burns 24 hours a day. The trash is constantly burning. And that became for Jewish society a picture of hell that Jesus refers to here, where the fire is not quenched, Jesus says. That refers to external torture. Those who are in hell are, are, are tortured through flame and through judgment. But also Jesus says here in this passage, where the worm does not die, and by worm, it's not talking about the ones crawling around in the dirt. It's talking about intestinal worms, tortured within as well. Those worms were a symbol of God's judgment and rebuke and curse. In Acts 12, if you want an interesting story, read about the death of Herod Antipas. Who, that's how he later died, was worms literally ate him alive from the inside out because of his wickedness and the way he treated the Jewish people. God cursed him with that. Jesus says, you're either going to be going to heaven, woohoo, eternal life, or you're not. So what's God's desire? God's desire is that we have life. And so he says here, and Jesus says in verse 49, a very interesting verse, he says, everybody will be salted with fire. Salted with fire. That's like the only passage in Scripture where that phrase is used. Everyone will be salted in, with fire. Now, he's talking about us. He's not talking about the wicked there. He's talking about us as Christians. We're going to be salted with fire. I don't know about you. I hear that. That sounds like judgment. Wait a minute. I thought that God, that Christ took all of our judgment upon himself. Yes, in terms of our sin, the consequences of our sin, uh, the punishment that we deserve, yes, that was placed on Christ, and so that no longer, that sin no longer is going to keep us away from the throne of God. But Jesus says, You will be salted with fire. This is a fire of purifying judgment, where the, the goal is not to condemn, like what we were facing, the goal is to purify us. The idea that we are a sacrifice, right? In the Old Testament, every sacrifice that was brought to the altar had to be seasoned with salt. It had to be sprinkled with salt before it was put on the altar. That's what Jesus is talking about here. You are going to be, you are going to be sprinkled with salt, salted with fire. Just a little bit of, of judgment. The, the, the purpose of it is that it's going to purify your life. In other words, you're going to face fire one way or the other, either the purifying fire here or the fire of condemnation. Now, what does that being salted with fire look like? The writer of Hebrews talks about it. Hebrews 12, verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. That's what being salted with fire means. Endure hardship as discipline God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us 
and we respected them for it, how much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Who likes being disciplined? Nobody. But, the writer says, endure hardship as discipline. This is being salt in the fire. We go through trials in our life. We go through difficult times because it helps us to choose to submit to God's authority, to repent of our own selfishness at times, the way that our attitude, the way we look at things, and allow God to mold us and to purify us, to make us more like Christ. Difficulty reforms our character as we humble ourselves before God. It's been said that we don't work for our salvation. That's absolutely true. We don't earn our salvation. We don't work for our salvation, but we, we certainly work at our salvation. In other words, being saved, having been accepted by Christ, and give, being given grace, God's kingdom as a free gift, we understand there's hard work in trying to become more Christ-like as we submit to his will in the midst of difficulty. So Jesus gives us important instructions. And if we are wise, we will listen to him. What are the instructions he gives us here in Mark 9? Well, he says, uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Is he being literal? I hope not, or there'd be a lot of us that wouldn't know where we were going or couldn't get there. No, he's not being literal. That would have actually violated scripture. Deuteronomy 14.1 says not to cut yourself. So that would have violated scripture. No, he's speaking in hyperbole. What is hyperbole? It's an intentional overstatement in order to make a point. We use this in our lives. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Is that really true? No. It's hyperbole. And everybody knows it. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, get rid of the simple, simple influences in your life, whatever you have to do, so that you may be purified. The truth is that even if I gouge out my eye, even if I cut off my hand, it's still not going to make me pure. Why? Because a sinful hand reveals a sinful heart. What we do illustrates, shows, reveals what is inside of our character inside of our heart. It's not a hand issue, it's a heart issue. There's a famous preacher, forgive me, I don't know which one it was, but this famous preacher had a clock in the back of his sanctuary, kind of like we do. I noticed this morning, like, I, I don't know if Doug got up there and changed or if it just changes automatically. I think it changes automatically in time. But this guy's clock was never right. It was either too fast, it was too slow, they tried several times to fix it, nothing worked. This clock, in fact, it kind of became a running joke. It kind of became a, a famous clock because it just was never right. So finally, the, the day came, this pastor decides, you know what? He, he covers the clock with a sign. The sign says, don't blame the hands. The trouble lies deeper. <laughs> it's not the hands' fault they're not accurate. It's, it's the machinations inside. My, my sin that my hands commit, my eyes commit, my feet commit, uh, they're not the problem. It's what's underneath that drives the action. Well, I find it interesting that Paul or that Jesus, how do I keep saying that? Oh, I'm off today. <laughs> Jesus mentions hand, feet, eyes. He doesn't mention the tongue. I found that interesting because like, that's what gets us into a lot of trouble, isn't it? It's not often the things that we do. It's a lot of times it's things that we say. Jesus didn't say, cut out your tongue. I find that interesting. But it's a heart issue, right? So if you sin, you, you have a heart issue, you confess it. You ask forgiveness. Now, if that grace is given freely, right? We receive that grace, and then we take steps, so not to make sure that we don't do that thing again. And Jesus' point is whatever you have to do to prevent yourself from doing that sin again, be willing to do it. Jesus' words here seem extreme when he talks about lopping off limbs, but because there's not one of us who would willingly say, I'll, I'll surrender an eye, I'll give up a hand and foot. None of us choose that. 
and it's not necessary that we do that. If your problem is stealing, you don't cut off your hand, you stop going to the store where you're tempted to steal. Or if you have to go to that store, you take a friend with you to keep you accountable, right? If your feet takes you somewhere where you're tempted, stop going there and avoid people that would ask you to go to those places. If you've got a pornography addiction, you don't gouge out your eyes, you get rid of your cell phone, you cancel your Netflix, you do whatever you have to do so that you're not put into those tempting situations again. But when Jesus says, gouge out your eyes, cut off your hand, cut off your feet, if that was the only possible way to prevent you from doing that again, would you be willing to do it? Now, it's not going to be necessary, but if that were the only way, would you do it? How much, he's calling into question, how much do we value our relationship with God? And he calls us to wrathful obedience. Jesus' point isn't to sever limbs. He's saying if we value our relationship with God, we have to be proactive about protecting it, whatever it takes. Because nothing that you sacrifice compares to the joys of heaven. Nothing that you would sacrifice here on earth compares to the reward you get when we receive our salvation. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. He says, Though you have not seen him, that is Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving, present tense, the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's what we're receiving. That's what we're excited about. And whatever we have to do to make sure we receive that, we'll get rid of any temptation. We'll get rid of anything we have to. Why? Because our relationship with God is clear. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Put it to death. <clears throat> A lot of times we don't do that, right? He said, don't put your, don't leave your sinful desires on life support. That's what we do sometimes. You don't really kill it. You just kind of put it in a medically induced coma, and then the next time we need a fix, we bring it back to life. Paul says, don't do that. Put to death. Belongs to your earthly nature. What happens we can focus on things here for our own satisfaction. The flesh, we focus on the self. We need to reprioritize because the only thing that should matter to us is our salvation. I would invite you to come up. Um, Tim, I turned off your guitar because that's what was coughing a little bit earlier. So I don't know if you just want to go all acoustic this morning. Um, I don't know. We can do that. Maybe that way we won't have any pops and loud noises. But as we finish, if you've been careless about your leadership of others, if you look at the way you're influencing others, it's like, boy, I don't know. If maybe we need to repent of some things. If, if your witness has suffered, ask for forgiveness and then walk in freedom and joy. If you have to apologize do it. If you have to make changes in what you allow to influence your life, let's do that. Why? Because what's important? Eternal life. The kingdom of God. That's what we're looking for. You pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for Jesus' instructions. And they're, they're difficult instructions. Father, help us to remember the way that we influence others. There's, there's consequences if we don't do that well. Help us, Lord, to make it our effort never to put a stumbling block in front of somebody else. And if we've done that, please forgive us. And help us to walk in a way of truth. Father, if we've allowed other things to influence us, Lord Jesus wasn't being literal when he said to, to lop off limbs. But he was saying, what's salvation worth to you? What's your relationship with God worth? What will you do in order to prevent yourself from committing a sin that offends God that Jesus already paid the price for? Help us, Lord, to be humble. Help us to be salt makers. Help us have salt among ourselves to encourage one another, keep each other accountable. Help us, Lord, 
uh, we salt and light because we're genuine. And Jesus said, if a salt loses its saltiness, that's really the way to that. If you lose your saltiness, what, what good is it? Help us, Father, to be a preservative influence on this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Okay, above all, this is one. Uh, Brother, what, Greg, what time is your outpatient tomorrow? Oh, you gotta be there at noon. Be there at noon, so we'll, we'll do prayer of orders for you as to that. As we sing this this morning, all power um, above all. Yeah, all power. Just think how glorious our God is, stand if you will. Above all power, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of
Give me Jesus through all this life and through all this uh, turmoil and all this grace that we go through. And just as we as we go throughout this week, and we've got Thanksgiving coming up. You know, it's a good reminder of what. Give me Jesus through anything, times and trials. Lord, we, we come to you and we give them to you. We give them all to you. As I said, it might not be a great day in my Let's find something to make that It's just one thing.
Because receiving the kingdom of God isn't so much about a place. It's not about streets of gold. It's not about a crystal sea. It's not even about billions upon billions of angels surrounding your throne. That's, that's all well and good. And eternal life isn't so much about longevity. It's not about going on forever. The, the, the word defines eternal life as knowing you. Having you. It doesn't matter if there's angels as long as we have Jesus. It doesn't matter uh, whether there's a crystal sea. It doesn't matter whether there's a tree of life. You are the tree of life. So Lord, help us to cling to you and to be rid of any obstacle that prevents us from knowing you, our Savior and our Lord. We pray this as we leave this place, Father. Make us in the images of Jesus Christ in our world. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Start out there in just a few minutes. Thanks for coming today.